Well, amen. Happy Mother's Day. Exciting, yes? Yeah. See some mothers that are here that aren't always here. We're glad that you can join uh, here together. And some kids that uh, showed up because mom guilted you into it. Great job. That's awesome. Moms de- deserve a lot of recognition and respect. Agreed? I wrote down in my notes, I hand write out all my notes and then I type them afterwards and I wrote out uh, the first kind of draft of this and I wrote out, um, without moms we wouldn't have, and I wrote out, society. I went back and I'm reading through before I typed it out and, and my handwriting, if you don't know, is not always the best. I'll just say it that way. And I'm reading my notes and it says, without moms we wouldn't have socks. And I thought, Socks. Where did I get that from? And I'm looking at it, and it looked just like so- socks. And I'm like, I think that's society. Yeah, without mo- we wouldn't have any people. That was the point, anyway. So, anyway, moms deserve a lot of recognition and respect. Here's why. They carry a child for months. They give birth. Then they run themselves rugged until the child turns 25. Right? I would say being a mom has its unique challenges, and that's why we celebrate Mother's Day. Many, many moms, and I'll say many people, and this is not really a Mother's Day message. I'm not always good at the, doing the um, uh, celebration kind of days. I, I just stick to preaching God's word, and we just, it, I fill it in somewhere. Moms, I would say, much like many people, they've been running so hard for so long that they essentially need someone to come alongside them and say, it's time to pull over. You've been running on empty for far too long, and it's time to refuel. And if I were to make this very specific and poignant today, I would say church, Milestone Church, It's time for us to pull over. We've been running for quite a while. But I can see clearly that we need to stop and refuel. What fuels us? How would you answer that question? If I say, let's pull over and refuel, we all have different ideas in our brain of what that looks like. So what is it that refuels us? To understand that, you must have an understanding of what forms us. What is it that forms us? For example, I drive a a pickup truck, and, and in that truck, if you pull the hood open, you'll see inside there is an engine, and that engine runs on gasoline. So to fuel up requires me to pull into the station that has gasoline and put gasoline into it. It, We understand that. That's our culture. We get that. If you have an electric car, you charge it with electric. If you have diesel, you put diesel in it. You can't mix them, and so what you do is you'd say, okay, what forms this thing? And so knowing what forms it requires, or, or, or then helps us to understand what fuels it and what keeps it going then. So when you look at yourself, you say, okay, what, what is it that forms me that will identify what will fuel you? Now, we have two different parts of us, the, the physical aspect of being a human being. What fuels a human being when you're just looking at the, the, the characteristics of being able to walk and talk and speak and all these other things, the, what fuels us is you need to eat food and drink water, yes? That will help us from a physical aspect, that will help us to be fueled. And sometimes, I don't want to ask for a raise of hands, but there's some of us that get hangry. You understand what that is, right? You need the fueling to kind of keep it together, right? And that's just as human beings, that's our physical body. It requires the food and the water to fuel us. You don't want to run out of energy, run out of steam, and that's just not a good thing. We are also, though, we are also made up of immaterial parts, which we call our soul, or figuratively, we call our heart. 
It's the part that can be broken, but doctors can't fix. It's the part that can feel hopeless and empty and tired after a full eight and a half, nine hours worth of sleep. It's the internal, immaterial part that you open up the hood on our lives and you look inside and you say, there's something, there's this immaterial part, there's this soul, there's this heart that we call it, that, that this is what really drives us. How do you fuel that is the question. What fuels up our heart, our soul? And to answer that, it comes back to understanding then how we are formed now this is a series that i'm doing so today is our introduction to this series so i'm spending a little bit of time to help us to grab the foundation of this so what forms our soul what forms our soul that's the question i want to kind of chase for a little bit here god formed our soul in his image. Genesis chapter 1, it talks about how God put us together. He created us, which is fascinating and unbelievable, really, as you look at what God did, because for us to create anything, to make anything, takes so much effort and energy. But God said, here, I'm making man in my image, and he did. So God formed us. God made us in his image. There's nothing else in creation that bears the image of God except for human beings, So God stamped, if you will, his image on us. He makes us in his image. Not not flowers, while flowers are nice, they're not in God's image. Not pets, not animals, not anything else is made in the image of God, just human beings. So we are specifically and intentionally made in God's image. So when you lift up the hood on our lives, you lift it up and you'd say, I'm made in the image of God. <clears throat> so what fuels what so the question is what fuel then goes into our soul's gas tank what fuel is it that gets us re-energized gets us going makes our life worthwhile gives us hope when we feel hopeless and this is important because i would say that many of our gas gauges our our fuel gauges are stuck on empty but we come into church and generally speaking a lot of times what happens is we come into a place like this and this becomes our kind of motivation to pick us up for a few hours and maybe for a few days to get us through and i get it For some, your marriage tank is absolutely on empty. For some, your your mom tank is just done. So what fuel goes into our soul, our heart's tank? If you're empty, sometimes what happens is you you sit there at, at... it's on E, right? and you're trying to pull the, have you ever done this? Like, you, you, you wouldn't do this, but have you ever driven, and you're like, I'm on E, but I think I can make it, right? And, and here's what I do. It, like, I did this once in my past, never again. No, I'm kidding. But I'm sitting there driving, and I think I can make it. So here's what I do. I ignore the fact that the thing is beeping on my dash. And I don't look at the gas gauge, because if you look at the gas gauge, then it's going to get emptier. You ever do that? It's a stupid trick that you play on your own brain, you know? Like, if I look at the gas gauge, it really... But you kind of ignore it and hope that it goes away, and I'm going to make it. And I will my car to get to where it needs to go. And, and yeah, it's just a foolish thing. Sometimes that's what we do with our own fuel gauge. We, like, I'll just ignore it, and maybe it'll go away. But I feel really empty and hopeless and purposeless, and that's kind of where I'm at. First John chapter 4 is where I want to land today. So if you open your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 4, this is written by one of Jesus' closest friends, the Apostle John. There's three that uh, Jesus hung out with the most, Peter, James, and John. And as he hung out with John, he kind of, he poured into him and he wrote the gospel of John and he wrote that and put his name on it, the one who Jesus loved. 
And so he had a very special, tight, close relationship with Jesus. And here in 1 John chapter 4, we are going to see who God is and how he made us so that we can then by the end of the, our time together be able to establish, okay, how do I fuel up? Because I'm tired of being empty. And you won't get fueled up in a moment. It's going to take a little season probably. But I'll give you the tool to do that. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. First, let's take a look at who God is. Verse 16, right in the middle of the verse, in verse 16, he says this, God is love. It is a declaration of the character and essence and attribute of God. He is love. It's a significant statement that when you look at the love of God in John 3, 16, for God so loved, when you see God, his character, his essence, his attributes, you look at love and it's almost as like it's at the top of the pyramid as far as character and, and his attributes go. Because everything seems to funnel out of that. I would say the closest one there is, is his holiness. But, but you look at love and you see this played out in everything that God does. It's his absolute character. So it's, I would say it's like the engine of the car. God's engine is a love engine. What is love? There's so much confusion about love today, isn't there? <clears throat> In the next few weeks, <clears throat> I want to spend some time describing what love is and help us <clears throat> to really gather our thoughts and our, our attitudes around love. <clears throat> Let me get a glass of water here. So that we can be more effective in this. That's my goal here. So verse 10. I'm going to walk back into this. I'm actually rewinding up the text here, and then we're going to go to verse 10, then we're going to go up to verse 7. Verse 10, he says, In this is love. Here's love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and has sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here's God's love. Here's what love is. God's fuel, God's love is that when he sent his only son, he sent him to pay for the sins of the world to be our propitiation for our sins. So, so here's what he did. His absolute engine was to love us by paying for our sin, by going to where we were, to where we are. Okay, those that are maybe a little bit older, if you're younger than like 30, you're not going to understand this. But follow with me. Maybe you will. Back in the 70s, probably a little bit before then, even the 50s and 60s, there were these cars, the muscle cars. Okay? This is going back before they had fuel-injected motors. They had carbureted motors. And you can still tell there's some cars that still have carbureted carburetors on their engine. You can tell that by following them. You can kind of hear the gas burning off the car. And here's what you'd have, and I think you had a Cordoba? Am I, or what did you have? Monaco. Monaco, that's what it was. Okay, okay. And, and it's like a V, was it V8? It was okay, yeah. That, that's the key right there. Eight miles to the gallon. Could you imagine? Eight miles, get in your Honda Civic. Eight miles, no, 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 that doesn't work. And here's what you do, and the, the thing about a lot of those cars is you'd go, and you'd go out of the stop sign or the, the, light and you would hit the gas and if you hit it too hard you could watch your tank go from full to empty just like that it seemed it just flew through the gas and you're like man and so you learn to be very careful with the gas we don't really have cars like that you can put it down and it's a little bit worse like but you're getting 10 15 20 30 miles a gallon and some even more than that so it's a little bit different here's the cool thing god sends Jesus to be our propitiation, to be our payment for sin. Listen to this. What happened to God's fuel gauge in that moment? When he put the, the pedal all the way down, I'm giving you everything I got. I'm putting the pedal all the way to the gown, all the way down to the ground, pedal to the metal. I'm giving my son to pay for your sin. Did the gas gauge go no it 
pinned itself up against full, more completely than it was before. That's counterintuitive. That's totally mind-blowing to us. Here's God's love for us, that when he, the fuel for God, it's this circular thing, the fuel that keeps God going, it's his attitude, it's his, or its attributes, it's his essence. He, he pours out his love for us, and then in that pouring of love out to us, he did not lose any of the fullness of the tank. He actually pushed it all the way down to the full. That's weird. God is love. Every action of love by God keeps God's gauge at full. For us, we are all formed in the image of God, so our tank must be then fueled with love. We need the same fueling. You pull up the hood and you say, okay, God made us. He stamped his image on us. If love is his essence, it's what fuels God, then what fuels us must then be love. There is no other fuel. So just like a gas engine cannot take diesel, We cannot take any other fuel. When we try other fuels, we get all excited for the possibility. It's like our car is parked on the side and we pour water into the tank. Like, oh, it's it's liquid, it's close, it should make it work. We get excited for a moment, but then we realize we're not going anywhere. Do you know how we do that? We do that by, I'm, I'm gonna go buy a new car. I'm going to fuel my life. I feel empty. I feel down. I feel lousy. And I'm just, I'm going to eat a a bowl of ice cream. Because food fuels me, so therefore it will fuel my immaterial parts. Some have tried that a lot, right? And, And we try to fuel us with fuel that's not intended to fuel us. So we try something we can buy. I'll I'll go get this, that, and the other thing. And it feels good. It feels so promising in the moment. And and, and then we we try it out. The, The engine doesn't go. And we have this momentary spike of excitement, but it fades down. So real fuel begins when we accept God's love for us. Go down with me to verse 10. He says, I'm sorry, verse 15. He says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So whoever confesses or accepts or recognizes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God then abides in him. These are big statements. These are churchy statements, right? Right? Last, yesterday we had men's group and we were talking about the, this here specifically. Here's the reality of what I'm saying. Jesus, the Son of God, think about this. Jesus is a human being that existed about 2,000 years ago. He walked on this planet with other people, hung out with them, had food with them, had meals with them, enjoyed their, their time just like we enjoy each other. Jesus, the Son of God. Hey, let me introduce you to my buddy. What's his name? Jesus. Guess who he is? The Son of God. Could you imagine this conversation? Think about the reality of what we're actually saying. He is claiming to be God's literal Son. And he is. And he lived then, in order to be God, he would live a a, a sinless or a perfect life. So Mary and Joseph are raising him up. They never had to ground him. They never had to spank him. They never had to scold him. They never had to get on his case. They never had to get him in the car before he goes to school and says this, make sure, Jesus, be good today. They never, ever had to say that. They didn't have to say, hey, be careful. Could you imagine the second child? James, strong with you. I wish you were more like your brother. He's God's son. I can't, right? He got straight A's. What's wrong with you? He's God. I'm not. 
So he lives a sinless and perfect life, and through his death, his burial, and resurrection, he is then extending. Do you catch that? His death, burial, and resurrection, not a small thing. To believe in the resurrection is massive, because that's not something that happens to well, every five people resurrect. No, this is one, and that's it. He is extending love toward us and then calls for us to believe in him, simply. This is the gospel. This is what forms us. God has formed us. And what forms our understanding then of him is the gospel. And then what fuels us is our love that comes from him. And here's the question. Have you personally taken the step of faith to believe in Jesus, the son of God? Now, I didn't ask, did you go to church? Did you grow up thinking about God? It's, have you placed your faith? Do you believe in Jesus, the Son of God? For some, there was a moment in time, like Nicodemus, when he talks to Jesus, where Jesus says, you must be born again, and in that moment was a decision. And for, for some of us, there's that momentary decision where we say, I believe what Jesus has done for me. I accept his gift, and we accept it, and we are saved for, from that point in time for all eternity from the penalty of our sin. And there's others that were kind of raised up in it. I'll say kind of like the Samaritan woman who's living her life but kind of has a cognizant understanding of, of who Jesus is. And so you, you raised up in it, and then there's this moment where you, you kind of put the pieces together. The distinguishing mark then after that is that point where we have accepted Jesus at whatever point, that, and, and we come to a point where we say, I want to go public with my faith, and we get baptized in front of people, identifying what God has done internally in us. What we're saying then is I'm made in the image of God. He loves me, and I've accepted his love for me. For some, accepting anyone's love for, toward you is hard. Accepting God's love is amazing. So then, what I'm going to share with you is a little bit crazy. It's, it, as I said already, it's a counterintuitive. And some will reject this altogether in your specific application of how you see this in your life. But we're going to work on this. Verse 7. Beloved, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another. If God's tank is for love, our tank should be identical because we're made in his image that our tank, what fuels us is love. That we love God and we love others. Beloved, let us love one another. What pushes our needle above empty is love. If you're on empty and you're trying to pull it back and trying to you know, fake it till you make it, the only way you're going to see your needle go off empty, broken, and, and just like, I, I'm just done and hopeless, the only way to get it from here up is to start with love. That's the fuel. It requires energy and courage for sure. And I, I would say that many people try to fill up their tank through self-centered means. They're concerned solely with their own needs and desires or interests. And so they're looking for all kinds of ways that's going to make them feel happy. And it's good for a moment, but it doesn't last. And it's not that your needs don't matter. It's just that your needs aren't met in the way that you're expecting. And, and your needs, getting those met is not going to fuel you up. It's temporary in nature. Think about it. You, you, you get your needs met, and before you know it, there's another need that needs to be met. And it's constant. Real fuel looks like loving others. Simon Sinek, who's he's written a bunch of books on uh, management, leadership, and things like this, he was talking to, uh, about a story about one of his very, very close friends who was going through a hard time. She was just on empty. And they had collaborated a lot on different things, and she was totally just empty and struggling and he would sit with her and, and try to coach her up. Not like in an official way, but just try to coach her up. And, and every couple of weeks they'd get together and he'd try to coach her up. And she was really going through a hard season, just really empty, depleted, and feeling hopeless. And, and he sat with her and tried to encourage and help. And, and she would leave feeling so much better. Because he, he was just loving on her in an appropriate way. She would go and 
A couple days later, she just kind of crashed and burned. Be right back down and just struggling. This went on for really several weeks as he tells the story about it. And he said, unintentionally, what he did was he said, man, he was struggling through some things as well. And he said, said to her, he said, hey, listen, could you coach me a little bit? I need some help. And he asked her to help in the specific areas. And she said, no problem, I'd love to. So she began to do that. And it was amazing as he recounts a story, an unintentional story, he recounts what happened to her in the next week. She went from being down and struggling to all of a sudden feeling hopeful and purposeful and all of a sudden just filled back up. Why? Because she began to love. She began to actually get her focus in on love and doing what she's called to be doing in that sense. And that's just one little picture. And maybe I'm oversimplifying in some ways, but I think this is, uh, there, there's so much credibility to what Jesus has done and what he's called us to do. Church, the reason we get together is I'm trying to fuel you up a little bit, but it's not just to give you a rah-rah session. My goal is to give you the truth of God's word so you'll focus in on him and you'll be refueled in his love for you and fueled up in how you love others as well. Love, then, he says in verse seven, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So love originates from God. Our purpose in our life is to love others. That's where God has called us to be. So we should be praying then, Lord, give me the courage and the understanding as to how to love like you do. That's where we should be. When we come into church, our setting here together, it's, Lord, as I'm in the car ready to get out, Lord, teach me, show me, give me the understanding and the courage to love other people the way you want me to. When you go home, it's, Lord, help me to love the people in my home the way you want me to. Give me the courage and the strength to do that. Listen, there are people that are really lovable, yes? There are people that are really not lovable. Yes? Right? <laughs> and we have both ends. If you have more than one child, you know this to be true. You know, if you've been married more than five minutes, you know this to be true. If you have anybody that you're, like you have relatives, you know this to be true. There's some that these are easy, these are not so easy. I don't know what you are. Hopefully you're easy. I don't know. But there's different things. And here's the reality. As we walk through life, it takes courage to love people. It's not automatic. I can preach a good message and say, you should love. And you say, that's nice. But you know, they're kind of like a jerk all the time. Which gives so much more credibility to God's love for us. How often are we that to him think about the reality <laughs> anytime we are unkind to someone else we are actually hurting God anytime that we are doing sinful things we'll just say it straight out we are hurting God and what does he do like the prodigal son the father running to him God is the same to us he loves us and is like he puts blinders on and says, I'm going to you even though you're filled with like all this filthiness and muck and mire and all this. I love you and I'm pursuing you and I'll keep pursuing you. And that's what he says. We didn't pursue God's love. God's love pursued us. That's how we get to know God's love. That's how we understand what love is by God's pursuit of us. Now here's... There's like, you know, the fine print at the end of those commercials about medicine that seems like there's a lot more fine print than the medicine's good for. I don't know what to say about all that, but let me just give you the fine print. I'd love to just get a raise of hands to, see, to feel the room a little bit, but for those that your, your needle's on E and you're looking at me a little critically saying he, he's telling me to love. Does he know how tired I am? Does he know how hopeless I feel? Does he know, like, what, he doesn't know what I'm going through? You're right, I don't. 
but God does. And I don't say that in a casual, empty way. I say that because God does. And, and, and then there are some that are kind of, your needle's not at empty, but it, you're at a quarter tank, and you're just wavering there, and you know it's, it's coming. To take a step of courage to love people that are unlovely to love anyone that's hurt you or to love anyone that has the potential to hurt you. It is risky and hard. It takes courage. And here's the thing. The needle is not going to instantly go off, easy, off of empty. I relate it to working out. When you work out or you go to lose weight, you want to get in shape, you go out that first day and you're all excited. I mean, you've got your, you're, you're up and you're pumped and we're going to do this and I'm going to get in shape. And you go and you run like, you know, three blocks or whatever. And you're like, <gasps> I'm gassed, you know, and you're, but it's all right. Tomorrow I'm going to feel awesome. And, and you, you jog and you push and you, you know, all this stuff. And the next day you look in the mirror, <sighs> suck your gut in. And there's no change except for the fact is I'm more sore today than I was yesterday. I'm getting a bowl of ice cream. But you don't because you know the process. Consistency is what helps you to actually get better. It's consistency. Your consistent efforts of loving others will eventually, not immediately, take your needle off of E and begin to pull it up. If you're cynical, God, I am so cynical. Forgive me for my cynicism. Thank you that you're not cynical toward me because you know my heart. Lord, give me the courage to love because I'm cynical. They're going to hurt me. They never hurt me before, but it seems like everybody hurts me. So God, give me the energy to just pull up off of E. And it takes time. It takes work. How, how many of you brush your teeth every day? Look around. Look around. <laughs> now listen, it should take, we have dentists in the house. How long should you be brushing your teeth? Two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Now, I had this idea that I really... The daily repetition of this was so annoying, so I, I gave up every day. So I just thought, if I brush my teeth once a month, two minutes, that, that would be like one hour per month. That'd be, that'd be good, yes? Listen, I'm putting the time in. I'm putting the time in. Like 60 minutes for one month, it's no different than every day versus once a month. <laughs> now, hopefully you're around me on that. I'm kidding. I did not do that. My point is... The repetition of loving people is an everyday occurrence. Don't wait till the end of the month to try it out. Because you'll have nasty breath all month long. And your teeth will fall out because you'll never figure out how to love. It takes every day having a discipline to say, I'm going to love. Lord, give me the courage and the strength to love. I don't know how to do this. And they really get on my nerves. And everybody kind of does. And I don't know what that's all about. But Lord, help me to learn how to love. Give me the courage and strength to do just that. So let me close out here. Uh, my goal in the next few weeks is to make this highly practical. So my question is, who do you need to love? Number one, what is one loving thing you should do, and when will you begin? Okay? You have ladies, you all got a notebook, yes? Isn't that a pretty notebook? Happy Mother's Day. Okay? Men, you got nothing. I don't know what to tell you. Write it on your hand if you have to. Write it on a piece of notebook paper. Write it somewhere. I list, listen, don't put this off, and maybe I'll do this later. No, stop it. I don't want to play games. I'm not here to give you a motivational speech. I'm here to give you God's word so you can apply it to your life and actually grow by it. 
So my question is, in regards to love, if you are a follower of Jesus and you understand God's love for you and you say, that's who I am and I need to love others, then stop and say, who do I need to love? Here's what I want you to do. Literally, write down at least a letter that identifies that person to you. Maybe their first name, their first initial, okay? That's the who. Second, what is one loving thing you can do? What's one loving thing you can do? Today, this week. Then the next is when will you do it? Now, here's what we're going to do. I have one more thing I'm going to say, but before I say that, I'm going to leave this up here. And do the unusual. We're going to take 60 seconds. We're going to pause. Those who are watching online, we're pausing for 60 seconds, but you can do this as well. I want you to get around about three, four, five, six people with the most people, and every single one needs to share one thing you're going to do to love. Here's why. When I say, what is one loving thing you should do? Sometimes you're not sure what the loving thing is you should do. Let's be honest. I ran out. I don't know what to do. So sometimes getting around other people that say, I'm going to be loving, you're like, oh, I, I never thought of that. that. That is loving. Great idea. Now, I'm not asking you to share names. Don't tell the who. And you don't even need to say the when. So I'm not asking, I'm, some of you are introverts. You're like, oh, this is terrifying. It's okay. It's only going, you have five to seven seconds to share. So uh, here's what, just real quick, ready? I want you to circle up and just share real quick what's one loving thing that you should do. Okay, ready? F find five or six people around you really quick. Ready, set, you have one minute and then I'm going to close. Ready, set, go. All right, you have 10 seconds. All right, here we go. You ready? Let me close this out. Thank you for your participation. I want you to repeat after me. Because God loves me, I have a lot of love to give. Last quote. Insight without action does not equal change. I've just given you the insight to do something with love. You've just practiced it by saying to others, here's one thing I can do. If you don't do it, there's no change. Your needle will stay on empty. God doesn't want that for you. God wants to fill your tank up to overflowing. So take a step of faith with the courage that God has given to you, with his instruction and understanding, and apply it and do it. Love others the way God loves you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for how you love us, how you never, never, ever quit on us. And Lord, to think that your tank is full and overflowing because you continue to love is amazing. Help us to wrap our mind around it as best we can and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, thank you. Enjoy today's Mother's Day with those that you love around you. See you.